Okay, welcome to week four, part two, in which we're going to talk <laughs> for just a second about our notebooks, which is really just a variation on our markdown. And we're going to look at some of the tools that are available in the tidyverse for doing data wrangling. That is, reading in information from files or from online sources and then massaging that information by uh, reorienting uh, columns into other columns if, uh, if the data set is not in what's called a tidy format. All right, well, we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Um, I'm very sorry for being slow with this, and I have already posted an announcement that the homework for this material is going to be due a week from Friday rather than a week from Thursday as I've been doing. All right, so let us begin. Um, so our notebook is basically just a variation on our markdown. Let me pull up an R notebook here. File, whoop, whoop, sorry. <laughs> I hid my R Studio, so let me pull R Studio forward. All right, file, new file, R Notebook, and basically it looks very similar to the uh, interface that we have for R Markdown. The main difference is in how you interact with this thing. Let me save this file. Uh, currently, it's untitled and not yet saved. So I'll say File, Save As, and go to my R for Data Science directory, and let's call this Example Notebook. Click Save. And when I click the Preview button, notice that there's a Preview button here rather than a Knit button. What that does is to display for me an HTML document of the current contents of this notebook. You'll note at the, notice that there's a chunk of R code in here that hasn't yet been executed. So when I do the preview, in my preview, I see that chunk of R code that hasn't yet been executed. All right, now if I execute that code by clicking the run current chuck chunk button, the result of that code simply gets incorporated into my notebook immediately below the code chunk. And now if I save this thing, control S, and do a preview, I have the code and the result of the code. Okay, so uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. It's, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so let us move on to the big, messy, horrible, awful topic of data wrangling. Basically, the idea of data wrangling is to get the data ready in your RStudio environment so that you can get to the transform, visualize, model cycle of exploring the data and seeing whether you can discover interesting questions within the data. Let me close this R Markdown, our notebook file. I don't need it anymore. There we go. All right, well, the first step is to import or read some data into R, into R Studio. And the reader, R-E-D-A-R, package that is loaded as part of the Tidyverse library provides a large number of functions for doing exactly this. You can pull files from disk into data frames. You can also, it turns out, manually type in representations of disk files in double quotes. That is, you can type in a string representing the contents of a disk file. And you can also, with several of these things, go out and access URLs on the web and suck down uh, copies of data. 
we're going to take a look primarily at read CSV, which reads a comma separated value text file from disk or from a string or from the web. And from that constructs a tibble, this slightly specialized kind of data frame that the tidyverse uses. In addition to being able to read a CSV file, you can read a tab separated value file. You can read a semicolon separated value file with a function called read CSV2, uh, read table, read delim if you have a table that has delimiters that are something other than commas or semicolons or tabs, you can specify a particular delimiter and read in your file. So if you have a file, uh, it's fairly common in Unix, for example, slash Linux, to have files, configuration files, whose fields are separated with colons. Or you might have a file whose fields are separated from each other with vertical bar symbols or what have you. There's also a tool you can use to read in a fixed width uh, file where the data is structured in terms of character column positions in this fixed width file rather than by uh, being delimited by comma or semicolon or tab or what have you. Now, all of these functions unfortunately assume that the data you're trying to access has some consistent formatting whether through some kind of delimiter character or through some kind of fixed line width uh, format. Unfortunately, a lot of data in the real world uh, does not fall into one of these clean categories. And so, in some sense, there's even preliminary stuff that you often have to do that may be better done outside of R before you even get to the point of having something like a CSV file that you can import. Uh, if you're in a big shop, if you're in a you know part of a big team, and your role is very specific to being a data scientist where you're expected to search for interesting questions in the data and find interesting results in the data and so on, you may have some other people or person uh, who might be called something like a data engineer who's responsible for doing that first level gory work of taking the the raw data in whatever format it's in and persuading that into a comma separated value kind of format that you can pull into R. But if you're working in a consulting kind of role or if you, well, I mean, if you are a consultant type of person within a company or whatever, you'll often find yourself having to perform that part of the job as well as doing the, uh, the importing and the tidying and the uh, data investigation kind of work. Now, here's an exciting thing to know. It turns out that there is no standard for what a CSV file is. Uh, everybody knows a CSV file when they see one, and everybody has this idea that, oh, well, it's just a file whose values are separated by commas on each input line, and each line has the same number of columns so that there are the same number of columns. I'm not sure I said that correctly. Each line has the same number of comma characters, so that there are the same number of columns represented in each input line. Now, we usually assume that the first line has the names of the columns or the names of the variables, if we look at this from a you know, statistical analysis point of view. And we assume that subsequent lines are the observations, uh, or the, the rows, of course. We sometimes may have empty fields, or we may have fields that are contained in double quotes. Empty fields will just come into our, uh, our environment as, uh, as NA values, and quoted fields will come in as, as strings. Also, we're usually tolerant of blank lines. 
Uh, sometimes in commerce separated value files, there are going to be blank lines to just separate visually the CSV file into sort of chunks. And when we pull this into R, we're just going to ignore the blank lines and basically treat them as though they were comments or something like that. But beyond these simple assumptions, uh, it's remarkable how much uh, inconsistency one can find uh, among CSV files. I had the pleasure in one of my jobs several years ago of writing a CSV file parser in uh, C++, and it's quite extraordinary uh, the, the variety of things that you can persuade Microsoft Excel, for example, to save in a, in a CSV uh, format. Now, fortunately, uh, online, when you go out and you download a CSV file, those files uh, are, like if you look at, uh, you know, data.gov, uh, for uh, federal and state and county and city data, those CSV files are usually groomed and cleaned in advance to make it easy for you to download them and use them and won't contain any uh, peculiarities that you'll have to worry about uh, cleaning up. Uh, but as a rule, that's, I mean, if you have to go out and get the data yourself, as opposed to somebody having obtained and cleaned the data and presented it to you, uh, you're, you're likely to run into surprises. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so here's an example of a CSV file that is in a reasonable format. We've got patients for some medical clinic. And the first line describes the column names. We've got the name, age, height, weight, gender, and smoker status of each patient. And then each line contains exactly six uh, entries of the appropriate uh, data types. So we have either M or F for gender, and either N or Y for smoker status, uh, a string for the name, and then we've got numbers for age, height, and weight. To read that stuff in, into R, we call the readCSV function and provide the name of the file as the argument. And that will suck in that file, construct a tibble, you know, this tidyverse kind of data frame from it. Uh, and we're storing that tibble, or we're referring to that tibble using this variable name, uh, pats. ReadCSV will also tell you what assumptions it came to or what conclusions it came to about the data types of the various columns. All right, so ReadCSV in this case recognizes that the name is a character string. Likewise, gender and smoker are character strings, whereas age, height, and weight are uh, read in as uh, doubles. Okie doke. Now, um, so that you don't have to type in <clears throat> the full, full path name of the directories leading up to your file, you can, as an abbreviation, use this uh, function setwd, set working directory. So I'm going to do that. Setwd, wd, and my working directory where this file is contained is c colon slash users slash j ostland whoops slash j ostland slash r for d s a for 2020 pretty sure that's it i guess we're about to find out <laughs> Now, um, notice that even though I'm running on Microsoft Windows, uh, I can go ahead and use forward slashes as the uh, directory separator. Uh, I may have mentioned something about this before, but th the ability to use forward slashes prevents you from running into nasty surprises if you, for example, 
tried to use backslashes instead, uh, and you had a directory named uh, neuter, then actually this backslash n here is going to be treated as a new line character, not as a backslash followed by an n. If you insist on using backslashes in your strings, then to protect yourself from this kind of problem, you have to double all the backslashes. And for heaven's sakes, nobody wants to do that. So you can use the Unix Linux style of forward slashes to separate directory levels, uh, even in a Windows system. All right, so R for DS A4 2020. And let's run that. And yes, I was correct. So now let's read in this patient's file. Read CSV patients.csv. And all right, well, I have hidden it somewhere apparently. All right, so I'm going to stop recording for a moment and track this down. Nope, silly me, the file is there. It is in the correct place. Uh, what I forgot to do, because I restarted my RStudio, is I forgot to pull in the tidyverse library. And consequently, the uh, function readcsv read is the thing that was not found. All right, so let's go do that again. And there we go. So the file was pulled in. I'm told how the columns were parsed. And when I display the patients, uh, I see the data that was in the CSV file. So this is a, a clean CSV file. Everything was well formatted. No missing values. No quote marks with extra commas flying around. Uh, all is well. And I get what I expected. Now, let's take a look at another file that uh, is slightly different. Uh, this one does have a, a missing name in the first record. It has a specific NA as the age for Guy. And the last row here, we just, whoops, the last row we just forgot to make any entries for the uh, the gender and the smoker status. So uh, this final person, Ida Joe, uh, is missing some information completely. It turns out that readcsv will uh, warn me about errors in here, but it will also successfully read all this stuff in and just identify as NAs uh, these things that aren't there. So let me read that one in now. All right, we're going to call this Pats2. And we'll read this one in. This is patients underscore 2.csv. All right. Now, I got a warning here about the ninth row of input. The, the other two rows where there was missing data uh, are not considered errors, so I'm not actually warned about those. Missing data is just missing data, no big deal. But the fact that the six columns that were expected, but there were only four actual columns in this file, uh, does deserve a warning. However, when I look at hats underscore two, uh, I will see that rather than just ignoring that line of input, the ReCSV did fill in NAs uh, for the two values that weren't specified. And here I have a, an NA for the name of the first record and an NA for the age in the seventh record. Okay. Now, patients three, um, in this example, rather than having column names as the first line, what I have here is just a note describing what this file is about. 
This is Patients of the Ortbus Medical Association. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a line that I just want to ignore. And it turns out that the read CSV function is happy to let me just skip over some arbitrary number of lines at the beginning of the file. Also, later on in here, sorry, uh, later on in here we have a comment marked with a pound sign or sharp sign or hash mark or whatever you want to call that thing. Um, that the uh, you know person in the office has put in here to indicate, uh, gee, we've got to ask guy's name when guy uh, or guy's age when guy uh, came to the office. Now, there's no default comment uh, symbol uh, when we do read CSV, but we can specify a comment symbol to indicate to read CSV to ignore lines that start with a certain character. So we need to do three things here in order to successfully read in this patients underscore three dot CSV file. First, we need to tell the uh, read CSV function what the names of the columns should be, since we don't want our column names to be patients of Ortbus Medical Associates, and we don't want the names of the columns to be Al. 22, 71, 165. We need to tell read CSV what those column names are. The second thing we need to do is to tell read CSV to just skip the first line. And the third thing we need to do is to tell CSV to ignore any lines whose names start with a pound sign. All right, so let's see how we do that. All right, we're giving the file name as the first argument as usual. Then we're specifying this call names argument as a vector of strings. So let's do this. Pats underscore three is going to be read CSV from patients underscore three dot CSV. And continuing on, all right, now I prefer not to type this in, so I'm going to turn off my yellow highlighter so I can copy and paste this guy. Whoops, come here. Uh, I don't need to do the indentation that I just did there. I just did it for uh, readability. <laughs> and our studio threw it away. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, so that specifies the column names. And I have used abbreviated column names since I, uh, even on my slide, I just didn't have room to type out name, age, height, weight, uh, gender, smoker. Um, I'm going to tell read CSV to skip the first line. And I'm going to tell read CSV that the comment character is the pound sign. All right, so I, I've had to do, uh, let me back up a step. Uh, I have had to look at the data file, and this is always number one when you're dealing with data. You have to look at the data file and figure out what it actually contains, not just assume that it contains things in the way that you want. So I've had to look at the data file and I've had to figure out that I need to specify the column names, I need to specify to skip the first line, and I need to specify what the comment character is. And once I've done that successfully, I do get Pat's three appropriately read in. Uh, I have a, an NA value for Don's weight and an NA value for guy's age. Okay, now interesting, okay, so um, in my actual disk file, I have a missing value for Don's weight. Let's see whether that's true. Let me pull over my
Let me pull over my uh, Linux style window here. Where you can see it. And indeed, for Don, in the actual file, I do have an NA for the weight. Uh, in the example file in the notes, apparently, I had replaced that with a 165. So I have a mismatch there, but that's, that's okay. That's fine. Okay, so <clears throat> that's uh, some quick examples of read CSV, which is probably the most common function that you'll use for reading in uh, textual uh, data, um, at least in the, you know, in the U.S. Um, in many countries where commas are used to represent what we in the United States use the decimal point for, that is to separate the, the, uh, the money amounts from the fractional money amounts or, or, or whole number part from fractional part of numbers in general, uh, you might need to use the read CSV2 which assumes that semicolons are being used as the field separator rather than commas. Okay, whatever. Now, for testing purposes, if, if all you're trying to do is to develop some testing code and you want a small little uh, tibble, a small little data frame that you can play with, it turns out that read CSV is smart enough to let you type in a data frame designation as a string. So here we have done as though uh, I have a file on disk containing these three lines of input. Let me just type this guy in. So Pat's uh, lit for literal here, read CSV. And what I've got here is a literal uh, comma separated value uh, file just typed as a string. So name, age, height, weight, that's line one. Now I can just hit the enter key and keep typing. Al is 22, uh, 71 inches tall, and weighs 165 pounds. I can continue hitting the enter key at the end of each line and keep going, or I can actually type in a new line character literally here. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, not literally, uh, symbolically as backslash n. Uh, so now I've got bell 2768 140. And there we go. So now I have manually typed in three lines as though that were the contents of a file. And Pat's lit is a data frame. And furthermore, read CSV is so clever that if I give a web URL for a CSV file, or for that matter, for a zipped CSV file, I can read that file in from the web. Uh, this happens to be the uh, Allegheny County Dog License Registry. from the year 2018. All right, and I can copy and paste this thing in. Poof, here are all of the Allegheny County, oh, I misspelled it, who cares, uh, dog licenses. Wait, why didn't that work? Oh, I see. I see the problem. Uh, I see the problem. I see the problem. Uh, okay, the problem here is that there are... Um, okay, on the screen here, uh, in order to get it to fit, uh, the lines are wrapped around, but they can't actually be wrapped around 
uh, on separate lines in R. So let me go back and paste these things together. All right, so there can't actually be a new line there, and there can't actually be a new line here. And I also need to put my LG County dogs and call the function read CSV. All right, so this, this time it should work because I've gotten rid of those uh, blank lines that I didn't want. Okie dokie. Yeah, now it's all just one long string. And it takes a few seconds. There, we pulled it all in, and here are the Allegheny County dog licenses for 2018. So altogether, 91,225 dogs licensed in Allegheny County. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, there is, uh, if you're not aware for, for your final project, uh, the U.S. government makes a ton of federal, state, county, and local data accessible through the website data.gov. Other countries also have uh, accessible data uh, available in a variety of formats. I chose one that was a CSV file. There are lots of other formats, uh, JSON files, XML files, uh, on and on. Sometimes these are zipped. Uh, Read CSV will, will handle the unzipping in the case of a zipped uh, CSV file. Alrighty. All right, so running these examples and accessing this online CSV file made things look uh, pretty straightforward, but in fact, there's a huge number of underlying decisions that have to be made in order to decide how to go about reading in a text file and representing that internally as a collection of character strings, double values, int values, and so forth. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I'm just going to uh, say that here, and I will ask you to read through a, a section of uh, the textbook in which uh, Hadley Wickham describes this, this huge number of decisions that have to be made and this huge number of assumptions that have to be made in order to be able to uh, properly uh, interpret and process the, the contents of a text file uh, into an R data frame. All right, well, once you've got a data frame that you've been manipulating that you want to save, then the write CSV function is the uh, inverse of read CSV. All right, so write CSV will take uh, either a tibble or a data frame and put that into a comma separated value file. By default, that file is going to be encoded using the UTF 8 character set. The UTF 8 character set contains within it virtually every character in any human language that is that is written. Um, and so it will work not only in the US but but also in other uh, countries. And it uses a standardized format for uh, dates and times. The purpose of this is to make it so that when you later on read this file back in with read CSV, the odds are high <laughs> that what you read in will be the same as what you wrote out. Uh, it's a very distressing feature to have data that you write out not be read in the same way as, as how you wrote it. Uh, so that's why uh, write CSV makes these uh, decisions of a uh, of a, a you know universally used uh, character set and 
uh, standardized date and time uh, conventions. Um, okay, so here's just an example. I'm not going to bother to do this interactively. We've got our PATS2 data set. It does have some NAs in it. If I write that out into a text file, uh, everything gets written out as you would expect, and NAs do get put into that uh, output file. Now, actually, my uh, ah, my data frame does have 165 as Don's weight. That's good, and we do have uh, NA for guy's age, and we do have NAs for the two values that were missing in the original patient, patients underscore two dot uh, CSV file. <clears throat> okay, so to work with the various tidyverse tools that we've been describing, uh, filter and select and mutate and uh, read CSV and write CSV and so on and so forth, the data set has to be tidy. And what is meant by tidy in the tidyverse is that each column has to represent a variable. Each row has to represent an observation. And the cells in the rows and columns uh, contain individual values. Now, this almost seems so obvious that it's sort of idiotic to even say. If you've done much analysis with statistics or if you've done much work with uh, databases, you're used to thinking of data being organized in this way. But if you don't have that kind of experience, then it's not at all obvious that this is how you should organize your data. And frequently, you know, well-meaning folks will decide that they need to save a whole bunch of data about their operations, their manufacturing process, logistics, drug trials, goodness knows what, and they will write down what seems reasonable to them at the time. And then you may have to deal with uh, whatever, they, whatever they decided to do, whether it's in this tidy form or not. For example, uh, let's suppose, well, actually, I do like to fly fish for trout. I do it every chance I get. I had zero chances, <laughs> zero chances during 2019. I'm hoping to have chances during 2020 once we're all released from isolation. <laughs> and let's imagine that I keep a a journal of my of my exploits. Now I I don't actually do that. I rely on my memory instead. But let's suppose I've written down in my journal that uh, May 18th of last year on the Root River, on a cloudy and drizzly day, I caught three brown trout and two brook trout. And on May 23rd in Beaver Creek, uh, on a cloudy day, uh, I caught four brown trout. And a little over a week later, on the west branch of the Whitewater River, uh, with scudding clouds, I caught five brookies and a brown. All right, and people who keep proper journals will will you know add lyrical things about how wonderful it was that day, blah blah. But this is the this is the gist of when I was there, where I was, and and what my uh, <laughs> what my results were for what I caught each day. Okay, now maybe I put this into a spreadsheet form. I decided I'd like to have some record of this that's better than just a pencil and paper. So I type this information into a spreadsheet. I've got the date of the trip, the location of the trip, uh, the weather during the day of the trip, and then the number of brown trout and the number of brook trout that I caught. In July, I go out to uh, Yellowstone and do some fishing in the Yellowstone River tributaries, and out there I catch uh, rainbow trout and cutthroat trout. 
Uh, I do catch one brown trout in the Madison River, and I also catch three rainbow trout and five cutthroat trout. So I add some columns for the for the rainbows and the cutthroats. Then I go down to Jackson Hole and fish in the Snake River. And then I realize, oh, cool. The Snake River cutthroat trout are a different subspecies from the trout I caught up in the Yellowstone River uh, system. There are both Yellowstone cutthroat trout and Snake River cutthroat trout. So I put in another column to keep track of you know, to distinguish between the Yellowstone cutthroat that I caught and the Snake River cutthroat that I caught. And now I start kind of mulling this over because I'm planning to go, I'm planning to go up to Montana to see if I can catch some bull trout. Uh, planning to go over to Utah to see if I can catch some Lahontan cutthroat and Bonneville cutthroat. And gee, you know, there's there's like a couple of dozen different kinds of trout. I'm gonna have my I'm gonna have my trout columns pretty quickly marching off the right side of my spreadsheet here, off the right side of my screen. And there are an awful lot of just empty cells in this in this uh, spreadsheet here. So as I think about this for a while. Sooner or later, I realize, you know, if I want to use this for some useful purpose, I really ought to think of each trout as being the observation, rather than each date and location as being a, you know, combined key for my observation. And I should realize that the date and location are just attributes of the trout. Likewise, the species and subspecies are attributes of the trout. I could be more refined about the weather. Um, I could keep track of cloudiness and windiness and raininess and, you know, even temperature uh, as separate uh, attributes, separate variables. And I can think about adding some uh, uh, additional variables, like uh, what time of day was it, uh, how long was the fish, how heavy was the fish, blah, blah, blah. So what I want to do is to reorganize the data that I have into a tidier, a tidy form uh, where each trout is an observation and the date, the location, the weather, the type of the trout are variables or attributes of each of each fish. Um, all right, so that is to be uh, hoped for, that you find yourself in a situation where the uh, data that you're presented with has got some kind of confusion about some columns actually representing values that should all be converted into a single column with, you know, brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, Yellowstone cutthroat trout, Snake River cutthroat trout as, as, as values within that particular column and so on. But sometimes your situation is, is much, 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 much worse. Uh, for example, one job that I was involved in uh, where we were analyzing data for a client, this was a, uh, well, this was a, a U.S. military uh, branch and they were doing maintenance on certain kinds of equipment at various bases all over the world. And they had a log, a, a database of all their maintenance actions. Okay, and so each maintenance action had a record associated with it. The first thing in the record was a unique job ID number. Then there was a date and a time and a base identifier and the specific uh, serial number of the uh, of the equipment that was being maintained uh, and then a variety of fields uh, describing uh, you know why the maintenance was required uh, whether it was being done on a uh, you know because the thing was broken or because it was routine maintenance 
blah, 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 blah. And then the last field, which is often the case, the last field was a uh, free text description uh, field. And all of this data was being entered by the mechanics at all these global uh, facilities. You know, this is a really common kind of thing uh, for uh, data being gathered by people who are not of a scientific bent, let's say. Um, and what we discovered as we worked with this data, and it literally took us, it literally took us months just to understand the data, uh, was that, um, you know, the mechanics are being required to enter this information into the system. The first thing that they would do when they when they're working on a particular piece of equipment is they would they would create a record for this maintenance activity and that would be assigned a unique job ID number good now bad news is that at the local maintenance facility is where the system assigned the job ID number and then at the end of the day that information was forwarded to a central repository. What that meant was that if in two or three or four different locations at approximately the same time on the same day, people entered information about work they were going to do, in fact, the same unique job ID number <laughs> would be assigned to all two or three or four of these different locations for this different equipment. So often the job ID number, you know, in one location would be about a totally different kind of equipment than, than the same job ID number uh, in, in some other uh, location. So this was the first, well, <laughs> this was one of many um, appalling things that we discovered about this data was that these unique job ID numbers were not in fact unique. Um, there were uh, dates in the records. Now the date happened to be the day on which somebody did some work, but there was no separate indication of when work was finished. And if two different people were working on the same piece of equipment um, on the same day or on different days, there would be uh, two different records for those two different people on the same day or on different days with that job ID number. And there was never any indication of when work was completed and whether the completion was uh, successful. Um, furthermore, it turned out that a great many of the folks entering this data believed that no one was looking at the data. <laughs> and so they would just slap in whatever they could get away with. And uh, so there was a lot of stuff missing. There was a lot of stuff that was just wrong. There was a lot of stuff that was guesses. And because there was a descriptive text field as the last field where you could type whatever you wanted, a great deal of the most useful information was actually in this totally unstructured text. Uh, it took a very long time for us to uh, to figure out uh, uh, using uh, you know editing and regular expression matching and blah 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 to to try to suck some interesting information out of that unstructured uh, text. So don't be shocked. Uh, <laughs> In fact, I'd be shocked if it were otherwise. Uh, don't be shocked when you get a client's data and start looking at it that it is not even internally consistent, much less tidy. So there's often <laughs> there's often some 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 gore that you have to go through. Uh, uh, to get the data to the point where you even have a prayer of making it uh, tidy in the in the tidyverse uh, sense of things. Okay, uh, you know, and that's just one of many uh, 
that's one of my more recent uh, horrific uh, experiences. I won't, I won't further bore you. All right. Um, so let's suppose that you do have a table that is in some kind of reasonable structure. And all that's wrong with the table is either that uh, there have been columns put into the data that really ought to be treated as values of the same attribute. For example, my, my trout example where you know I had different columns for different kinds of trout. Really, I should have just had a column for the type of trout with uh, rainbow and brook and brown and so forth as uh, values with, within that column. Um, another thing that occurs as an alternative is that sometimes the, uh, a single observation may be separated across multiple rows uh, for some reason that made sense to whoever developed the data. And you need to consolidate a bunch of rows together into one as opposed to consolidating a bunch of columns together uh, into one. The tools that the tidyverse provides for consolidating columns and consolidating rows uh, are called pivot longer and pivot wider. And we'll take a look at pivot longer for my trout example. And you can just imagine pivot wider just goes the you know, goes the other dimension. We're, we're going to consolidate columns from multiple columns down to one column, hence making the data set longer. There are going to be more records with fewer columns. And pivot wider just does the opposite thing. It, it ends up adding columns so that an individual observation can be represented in one row uh, and with multiple columns representing the values that had previously been strewn across multiple uh, rows. Okay, so here I've got the comma-separated value version of my uh, trout data, at least up through uh, Jackson Hole. And you'll see that there are all kinds of missing values in here, um, because if I, if I didn't catch a certain kind of fish, I wasn't thinking about, you know, numerically analyzing this stuff at the point where I created this format. And so rather than saying, well, on this stream, on this day, I caught three brown trout, two brook trout, zero rainbow trout, zero Yellowstone cutthroat trout, and zero Snake River cutthroat trout. I just didn't put anything in for those fish that I didn't catch. All right. So we can read this thing in uh, using read CSV. And I do have these uh, strings from <coughs> Excel providing labels for the columns. And in R, the uh, the column names have to be able to be used uh, to access values. For example, I need to be able to say things, here I'm looking at my patients to tibble, I need to be able to say things like pats to uh, dollar age to be able to get the vector of ages uh, from that uh, data frame. Well, unfortunately, these uh, these column names here have space, I can't highlight it. Let me turn off the highlighting here. These column names have spaces in them. And you can't have a space in a so-called so syntactic column name in R. So what are, so one of the nice features of R <laughs> is that if you use a so-called non-syntactic name, um, that's okay. Rather than giving you an error, uh, R will allow you to represent that, and you just have to forever remember to put single quotes, uh, single back quotes, excuse me, 
around that so-called non-syntactic name. All right, so this is this is appalling. Um, you do not want to make your life even harder than it already is by having to put back quotes around uh, non-valid, that is, non-syntactic uh, column names for things. So one thing that we'll want to do later is to use uh, substitute. No, I'm sorry, wrong wrong name is to use select to select and rename these columns in this uh, data frame so that I no longer have to fuss around with uh, non-syntactic names. Actually, we're going to get away with this. We're going to get away with this because we're, we want this column to go away anyway. So what had been a non-syntactic name for a column, Yellowstone space cutthroat and sn snake space river space cutthroat, those are going to disappear because we're going to consolidate together all of these trout type uh, columns into values in a single column. So we're, we're going to luck out. Uh, but but uh, if you find yourself with non-syntactic names, for heaven's sake, uh, fix them before you go completely crazy. All right. So here is what this... Uh, data frame looks like after I've read it in. And I do actually have this thing. So let me uh, let me read this thing in. I can say uh, JKO let me first confirm that I do actually have this thing available. So JKO Trout Okay, here's the, uh, there's the Excel spreadsheet, which is, of course, binary. And here is the CSV version of the spreadsheet. And now I'm going to read that thing into our studio. So, JKO Trout, read that in with read CSV, JKO Trout.CSV. Okay, and there's my non-syntactic names, <laughs> and here's JKO Trout with all kinds of NAs for fish that I didn't catch. All right, so we want to use pivot longer to take all of these trout type column names. I've got five of them so far and turn them into one column with the <clears throat> original cell names, okay, brown, brook, and rainbow, stored as values in the new column. Here's how I use this pivot logger function. So this is going to be JKO version 2. I'm going to start with JKO trout and pipe that into pivot longer, and for my new column, I want to provide the <clears throat> values that this new column can take on. So the values are the column names here. So I can uh, type these guys in. Uh, Brown, Brook, and I'm tired of typing now, so I'm going to copy and paste. Rainbow, get rid of those parentheses so I can type more stuff on the next line down, and then I've got my Yellowstone cutthroat. And my Snake River cutthroat. Okay, so those are the columns. Those are the names of the columns 
that I want to collapse into a single column. The name of the new column in which these columns are going to be values is called uh, just type. Maybe I should say trout type. Okay, so uh, I'm going to have a column trout type and the columns, brown brook, rainbow, yellowstone cutthroat, snake river cutthroat, are going to become types within that column. Then the particular values that were within these cells um, have to be accounted for somehow. And those values are going to go into a second new column called count. Okay, so, so instead of having brown 3, brook 2, rainbow NA, I'm going to have three rows where there will be trout type, and brown will have the value 3, brook will have the value 2, and rainbow will have the, the count, excuse me. All right. Brown will have the count 3, Brook will have the count two, Rainbow will have the count and A. So let's see whether that does as I claimed. JKO V2. Yes, so instead of Brown, Brook, Rainbow, Yellowstone Cutthroat, Snake River Cutthroat, <laughs> I out clevered myself and created a non syntactic column name, uh, Trout Space Type in which the types of the trouts that used to be column names are now values. Okay, so uh, 18th of May 2019 on the Root River, on a cloudy and drizzly day, the brown trout that I caught were three. And on that same day, same place, same weather, the brook trout that I caught were two. Uh, the rainbow trout, Yellowstone cutthroat trout, and the Snake River cutthroat that I trout were, were, were none, not, not available. Uh, those NAs, you know, really ought to be zeros, or I can just eliminate them entirely. All right, so, actually, I also want to get rid of this count field, because as I've been thinking about this, I've realized, you know what, um, I might be interested in keeping track separately for each trout, uh, how long it is and what its weight is. So I'm interested in more detail now on my future trips. I don't want to just know, oh, I caught three brown trout. Um, because catching a 24-inch trout is a whole heck of a lot different experience than catching an 8-inch trout. So I might want to add length and weight columns. And therefore, I want to separate out each one of these counts into a separate row to represent a separate trout. Turns out there is another nice tidyverse function I can use called uncount that will take a column of counts and eliminate that column and instead replace that one row with that count to that count many duplicate copies of the row. Uh, so instead of having uh, 18 May 2019, Root River, Cloudy Drizzly, Brown 3, what I'll have is three rows that all contain 18 May 2019, Root River, Cloudy Drizzly, Brown. All right, I'll have one copy of that row for the first fish, another copy of that row for the second fish, another copy of that row for the third, uh, for the third fish. I also... Rather than filling in a bunch of zeros here, I just want to eliminate all of these NAs for fish that I didn't catch in various places. So before I do my uncounting, I'm also going to do a filtering like we did before so that uh, all of the uh, NA values are simply excluded or filtered out from the data frame. Okay, so... JKO v3, 
is going to be JKO V2, which is what I'm seeing here, but with the is not counts excluded or filtered out and with uncounting the count column and while I'm at it let me select trout type from trout space type in backticks. Can't subset columns that don't exist. Oh, <laughs> I misspelled it. Silly me. All right, I got, I got, uh, so let me, uh, let me try this again. So we're going to do that step and then the filter out the not NAs and then the select, the uncount. And then I will do my select, but I will correct my spelling. Cool. There we go. JKL V3. <laughs> uh, okay. You probably see what I forgot. I forgot to add all the other columns uh, when I did my select. So I want to uncount, I want to select, but I also want uh, everything else to be included. Finally, there we go, cool. So I've got my, uh, my trout type, my date, my location, and the weather uh, for each trout that I caught during this uh, period of time. And now I have the uh, data in a tidy form that I can use uh, for a uh, tidyverse kind of analysis. Okay, well that is some coverage of tidyverse tools for ingesting and tidying data. And I feel somewhat as though uh, I have not done nearly enough uh, to prepare you for the horrors <laughs> that are that are ahead. All right, so. Um, um, when you start dealing with, with real data sets from real clients who did not have clear knowledge of how to create appropriate data sets when they started gathering information about their uh, processes, um, you know, you will need to know about how to read the data in, and you will need to know how to tidy the data once you have read it in, but you're very likely to be faced with lots of other uh, gore that you just are going to have to use other tools to fight with, other tools to deal with, uh, before you even get to the point of being able to read the data in. Okay, so with that, <laughs> with that bit of encouragement, uh, we, are, uh, we are done and... Uh, uh, If I did not say so at the outset, I've forgotten whether I said so at the beginning, I apologize for being so late with this uh, lecture. And I will, uh, since I'm just getting this posted on Thursday afternoon rather than Friday afternoon, but rather than Wednesday, um, I am going to give you until Friday evening, Friday just before midnight, to uh, accomplish the homework uh, about this material. Okay, so take care. If you do have any questions about anything, uh, please feel free to email me.